So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing such a wonderful meeting. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm a little bit afraid because my topic is purely mathematical. However, uh, I have a strong feeling that there are some philosophical aspects and I'm still looking for more applications. So, uh, also, uh, I'm not used too much to Beamer presentations, so there may be some mistakes and or some things will be missing. Oh, fortunately, we have this small blackboard. So, <coughs> uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, what a mathematical structure is. Simply, for me, uh, I agree with the statement that uh, it is not good to think about a single mathematical structure rather of a category. Yes, so, and there will be quite a lot of category theory here. So, but I have to explain what generic means for me. So, uh, in general, this is some old topic. So I start with some history. Hmm. Well, it, it goes back to Cantor, I would say. Something which everybody knows or at least everybody who studied some mathematics. So the set of rational numbers is uniquely determined by these properties. Yes, so dense means between every two points, you have one more point at least, so infinitely many, no maximum, no minimum. I even cannot say which year was it, still 19th century, yes. And um, well, the original proof, as far as I no, was not by this, how what we know now, a back and forth argument. Yeah. This was after Cantor. Okay. Never mind. So this is more or less a motivation. So now you may guess that the set of rational numbers is generic in some sense. It's uh, first of all among uh, countable linearly ordered sets. It's the most complicated one. Uh, well, it has some nice properties which are not stated here. So, for instance, every countable linearly ordered set is isomorphic to a subset of this one, right? So look at countable linearly ordered sets as a category. Yeah? So this one is universal. People in model theory would say universal. Yeah? And it has some strong homogeneity property. I will mention homogeneity later. So. Let's just continue. Now, another thing, which is already in 20th century, mm, due to Urison, and this is not well known. Okay, it's becoming more well known, uh, say, in the last years, due to some topological dynamics. But uh, I can say that it has been forgotten for at least 50 years. So Urison uh, was a, topo a Russian topologist. He did quite a lot. He invented, somehow developed dimension theory. He died in 1924, uh, swimming in the Atlantic Ocean. And this paper was published posthumously, as you see. And uh, so, for example, when, when I was a teenager and a student, my favorite book on topology, general topology, was by Engelking, Richard Engelking. Yeah? And so this result is mentioned only as a remark in exercises, that another construction of a universal separable metric space is due to Urison. Uh, well, so uh, first of all, for those of you who are not in mathematics, uh, Polish metric space means a metric space which is separable, has a countable dense subset, and complete. Every Cauchy sequence has a limit. So it's an established notion, call it Polish. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> so this particular space, U, I, I denote it by this bold font, U, has such a property. So given finite metric spaces, smaller and bigger, any isometry of the smaller extends to an isometry of the bigger. By isometry, I mean obviously preserving the distance, isometry into, yeah? So very often it's called isometric embedding. So uh, 
first of all look at this A could be empty. So what you get? Every finite metric space is inside you. Imagine any finite set and out with a metric, you will find a copy of it in, in you. You can go farther actually. Every countable, because you may use induction, yes? Every countable metric space, you can represent it as a chain, A0, A1, A2, bigger and bigger. Using this property inductively, you get an isometric embedding of the union. But then, after a basic course of metric topology, you know that such an embedding extends uniquely to the completion of the union. So every separable metric space is inside you. It's somehow similar to this. Yeah. Okay, what is, uh, once you know the proof of Cantor's theorem by a back and forth argument, then you may realize that this space is uh, homogeneous. Okay, I have this notion of homogeneity on some other slides, but let me just say it here. So, this is our on space and what is homogeneity? Well, people call it ultra homogeneity. You have two copies of the same finite metric space A0, A1 and you have an isomorphism from A0 to A1 and it always extends to an automorphism. Automorphism means, uh, sorry, I said isomorphism in the category of metric spaces with isometries, yeah? Or with non-expansive non mappings would be. So isometry, isomorphism is isometry. And automorphism is a bijection which is an isometry. And you prove it uh, by a back and forth argument, extent. Okay, I would need to draw two copies of you. And uh, find in each copy you, I will construct a chain star. In one copy starting from A0, in the other from A1, and I would extend these isometries, you know, back and forth. I don't have really time to explain all the details, but this is some important property after all. So, uh, next thing. Uh, so, uh, the name Freise, Roland Freise, if you have not studied any model theory, you don't know this name even. Yes? So he was a French mathematician, died a few years, something like 10 years ago, at the age of 80. He was known from theory of relations, some model theory. Okay, and if you type his name in Google or Wikipedia, you will hear about Aaron Foyt Freise game, which was some, the game was used to decide which two models are elementarily equivalent. <coughs> Fraser limits are a little bit lesser known, but if you open any good textbook in model theory, you will find this concept. So this comes from the 50s, so it will be on the next slide. So in order to formulate it, I have to introduce some definitions. So what is a Fraser class first? So it is a class of finite structures closed under isomorphy. So let me explain. As in this setting, a structure is a set with some relations, possibly some algebraic operations. And actually, Freiser did not allow algebraic operations. But it's not important. And now, uh, so closed under isomorphism is clear. Yeah? Um, countably many isomorphic types. So what does it mean? F could be a proper class. So, typical example, all finite linearly ordered sets. It's a good example for F. Of course, this is a set theorist would say a proper class, but subsets of the natural numbers. Yeah? If you take them, they are, they are countably many and any other is isomorphic. Actually, the cardinality decides the type. But the same would be with finite graphs. The cardinality does not decide 
the graph anymore, but still no problem. Uh, okay, what is a counterexample to this would be finite metric spaces. Uh, you can define finite metric spaces as relational structures, even with countably many relation symbols. What? Because you may say for each rational number, call it r, you may say that the distance of two points is less than r. Yeah? And take all these relations. So you will describe all metric spaces and not only, of course. Um, but every positive real number gives you a two-element metric space. Yeah? And they are all pairwise different. So this, so Ureson doesn't fit into this, but it's close to this. Okay, so uh, this thing which Freiser assumed closed under substructures with obvious meaning. Uh, and uh, so this JEP is called joint embedding property. So you take any two structures from F, you can always put them together into a bigger structure. It is typically very easy to check. So uh, now I put it in red because this is somehow crucial property, amalgamation property. AP stands for amalgamation property. So given any two embeddings, you can always find some bigger structure. Okay, two embeddings with the same domain, you find some bigger structure and embeddings making this commuting. So now again, this could be, so as you see, this is purely category theoretic. Yeah. And <coughs> so a diagram is rather obvious. You have C, let's say B and A, and this is what it says, yeah. Category theorists would immediately see push-outs here, yes, but I do not assume that it is a push-out, just any amalgamation, yeah. So for, for instance, in the class of uh, finite linearly ordered sets, what does it mean? You have <coughs> such a finite set, C, and a and B come by adding more points, yeah? somewhere between, on the left, on the right. So what is this D? Draw all the points on a single line. This is what you collect will be D. So there are many possibilities, of course, typically several. Yeah? And uh, if you take, say, finite graphs, so imagine this, yeah? this is a good example. This is C. Now it's extension A, and I draw the other extension B by this way, yes, so that B intersection A is precisely C. You can do it, yeah, by simply replacing some new vertices by other points. And now the union is already a graph. And this is indeed the push out in the category of graph homomorphisms. <coughs> okay, so this is somehow important thing and now aha, one more thing what Freise maybe not Freise maybe people before him call it uh, so the age of a structure is all finite structures isomorphic to substructures of X yeah so if you take for instance every infinite linearly ordered set infinite the age is the class of all finite linearly ordered sets. Yeah? If you take some infinite graph, then the H may not be all finite graphs, of course, yeah? depending on how the graph looks like. Okay, and this result is uh, that once you have a Freise class, then there is a unique countable structure such that the H of this structure is precisely F. So no, no more and no less, yeah. And and is this extension property which was already mentioned in the context of metric spaces. And this is not a typical formulation of this theorem. People usually write U is uh, ultra homogeneous in the sense that every isomorphism between substructures 
finite substructures of U extends to an automorphism, the H equal, equals F here, yeah? and that's all. That's equivalent. So, uh, from this extension property, using back and forth argument, you prove this ultra homogeneity. And homogeneity, ultra homogeneity plus this property gives this extension property. It's an easy exercise, but I don't go, I'm not going to the details because of time here. So, this U is called the Freise limit of F. And as it, as it happens, until maybe the beginning of the 90s, uh, this, okay, so <clears throat> this result, first of all, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, I, want, I wanted to say that until the beginning of the 90s, at least, this was purely in model theory, not outside. And, uh, yeah, uh, the result has some importance. Why? Because... Uh, Okay, the proof of this theorem is not difficult. It's elementary. You just construct this model. So the important thing was to really to discover this general construction. And uh, it simply gives uh, ways for constructing some interesting models, so-called very often omega categorical structures, etc. Uh, but I, I don't want to talk about model theory today. Um, Okay, what else do I... Oh, and uh, also this, this is an important feature of the Freise limit, that it is really the richest countable structure. Yeah? In the, no, not only... Because from this property, suppose that F consists of... Uh, is a relational class, yeah? no algebraic operations. Then the empty set is in F. So you can always start with A, the empty set, and then every B embeds into U. But here you have more, yeah? Every countable. And the proof is easy. All right. Ah, so this is this... Uh, I usually call it homogeneity. However, uh, for some people, homogeneity, like for topologists, homogeneity means that for every two points, you have an, a homeomorphism moving one to the other. And so that is why people often add this ultra. So this is this what I already set, yeah? Every, every partial isomorphism from, say, small substructures extends to an automorphism. So let me repeat up until the beginning of 90s, this was only in model theory. So there was a paper, aha, uh -huh, Freise theorem has a generalization which many people ignore or actually are not interested to uncountable. Structures. So this was done by Jonsson, uh, I think Swedish, Scandinavian mathematician. So now some people say Freise Jonsson limits if they mean arbitrary cardinality. And uh, it was uh, written in the language of category theory by Droste and Gebel. Uh, two algebraists, let's say. Manfred Droste is maybe more a computer scientist. Uh, Rudiger Keppel was a pure algebraist, already passed away. And uh, they needed some examples from algebra, where the embeddings were not embeddings, some, some other arrows. So, uh, in any case, for people from category theory, this is clear that Freise theory is purely category theoretic. Yeah? So, I, I will mention more details later. Now, some examples, yeah? So, classical, more or less. So, as I, I don't need to comment on this. It's obvious. Uh, oh, now, so I said that the Urison space is not the Freise limit in this setting because uh, it's countably many types, yeah? This is violated. But, if you consider <coughs> finite metric spaces with rational distances, everything is okay, yeah? And there are countably many. The only Say non-trivial thing is amalgamation property. But let's say if A comes by adding exactly one point from C to C, B the same, then you only need to declare the distance. So again, this is an exercise and not difficult to find. The 
right, to construct or to extend the metric. So amalgamation property indeed works. Uh, yeah, as you may possibly expect, the completion of the rational horizon space is the full the horizon space. Yeah. But it needs some work to show it. Okay, now something I say R dash Reni Rado graph, some people call it random graph. So yeah, after this what I have presented already, you know that this, this is a Fraser limit of finite graphs. Finite graphs satisfy all these axioms, so this is a Fraser class. Okay, neither R dash and Reni nor Rado viewed it as a Fraser limit. They didn't know Fraser limit. So Erdes and René, in a joint paper, uh, looked at random processes which... So you have some infinite random process, and you look what kind of countable graph you receive. So you throw a coin, and you draw, a verte uh, you draw an edge or not, yeah? more or less like this. And with probability one in this standard process, you obtain some uniquely determined graph. They, they showed it. That is why it is called random graph. Richard Rado had some other motivations, and it was at the same time, so independently discovered. Maybe Erdes René were slightly earlier, one year or so. Rado constructed this graph on the natural numbers. So I can try to say the definition without writing anything. So. Imagine you have positive integers, and I declare I have a natural number n, and I would like to say to which smaller numbers it is connected by an edge. Yeah? So I take a smaller number, call it k. Uh, I look at, uh, sorry, uh, the bigger was n, yes? Maybe I draw this k less than n. Okay, so I take the binary expansion of n. I have a sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, so let's say that the natural numbers start from zero because the zero place is a place has some meaning. So I say that n is connected to k if I have one at k place of this binary expansion. Yes. So, for instance, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, such a number would be connected to 0, not connected to 1, not connected to 2, connected to 3. Okay, that's the definition, that's all. And uh, what do you get? Uh, so, the random, let's call it random graph. It has the following property. This is our graph countably many vertices, some edges between them. And imagine two finite disjoint sets. There always exists a vertex outside of the union, which is connected everywhere here, and not connected to anything here. If you take this definition with natural numbers, this is quite obvious, yes? You take a sequence of zeros and ones with the property that at, at all places from B you have zeros, all places from A you have ones. To be sure that it is really bigger than all these possible numbers, add some one on the top of it, yeah? That's it. Okay, but now <coughs> imagine that, so let me erase it for a moment. Imagine a finite subgraph of G and its extension by adding one more vertex outside. Yeah? So I'm talking about this extension property. I have a finite graph already embedded inside G, and I have one more point outside. I want to realize this. I want to extend the embedding. So I look at all vertices connected to V. This will be my set A. All vertices not connected to V. This is B. And the property I said before, 
tells me that there is some vertex, yeah? so I can map it here so that this is realized. Yeah? So this is the extension property. So now you may believe that this is indeed the Fraser limit. Yeah? yeah, I have to. Okay, another example countable atomless Boolean algebra, of course. Well, these are algebraic objects already, so but it's easy to check that everything works here. Ah, there is another object. It was Philip Hall who constructed a quite interesting uh, countable group, which is locally finite. What does it mean? Every finite subset generates a finite subgroup. Yeah, so all finitely generated subgroups are finite. <coughs> and he proved uh, that all finite groups are inside. And moreover, every isomorphism between finite subgroups extends to an inner automorphism, even stronger homogeneity. Without knowing Freise limits, he did it explicitly. <coughs> and it is interesting that, uh, well, so it, it follows because I forgot to say that Freise theorem can be reversed. Once you have such a Freise limit or some structure which, is, which has this extension property, etc., its H is a Freise class. In particular, has the amalgamation property. Uh, but try to prove that finite groups have the amalgamation property. It's not trivial at all, but it's true. A standard amalgamation push out gives you an infinite group. So that's, that's the problem. Okay, and now, uh, yeah, just to, to show you that finite structures could be Freise limits. So finite cyclic groups has this property. You can easily check this. Uh, any countable set, of course. So this is not interesting at all, yes, but on the other hand, if you take finite sets, I satisfy everything. These are finite structures as well, with no relations, no algebraic operations. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have to go on. So now, you see, I wanted to say something more abstract. I don't like model theory that much. Yeah? I mean, I like, but uh, I don't think this is the only part of mathematics where such objects should be studied. So. I wrote this kind of stuff as introduction to some paper and some research proposal as well. So this is for people who never heard of category theory, perhaps. Yes? So evolution, this is how I call it, evolution scheme, yeah? abstract evolution scheme. So what does it mean? It's, after all, this is a category, yes? except, I would say, cellular category. So you have some initial state. Weekly, it's really weekly initial. Okay, can call it. In, it I mean, I just want to, not to make confusion with initial object. Yes, that's why I write the properly weekly initial. So we have some state from which we start our evolutions. So a evolution process is a sequence. Yeah. So actually, there's a bit less. This is really a directed graph. Yeah, with some properties that you have a special vertex, which is at the very beginning. Uh, to every other vertex, you have a path. This is what it says here. Yeah? And uh, arrows, the arrows of the graph are called transitions. Yeah? And then it generates a category, of course. So I will not elaborate this thing so much. Yes, but this is how you can think of objects generated by evolution processes. But in order to talk about it, you really need to invoke basic category theoretic notions like colimit. Actually, colimit is the only thing needed. And uh, in the case of model theory, the transitions could be uh, adding one more element. Yeah? So from x to y, a transition from x to y is an embedding from x to y such that y differs from x by exactly one element, or, or at most one element. 
Okay, in never, never. So now, uh, the crucial property, which is related to Fraser limits, yeah? So abs I call it absorption property. It should be a better picture here, because actually no picture is only this thing. So, okay, but I can try to draw it here to explain this definition. So, yeah. Uh, remember that we start from E, from this initial state, it doesn't really matter so much. Now, <coughs> the absorption property means that we are at stage N, and we have some transition to Y. Yeah? This, is, so this diagram is somehow missing on the slide. That's why I'm drawing it. So <coughs> you may find a path, which, which means several finitely many transitions, such that you are again back in the sequence, and the composition, so you go by this path, the composition of all this is, a, is this, well, not a transition anymore, it's a sequence, the path from Xn to Xm, okay? But of course, after all, this is in category theory, and uh, why uh -huh. can be reached. Yeah. Hmm? Okay, fine. Yeah. One more slide. This is it. Yeah. So uh, what I should explain is this, yeah. This this uh, is something perhaps new. Uh, so after all in this in order to describe objects like uh, perhaps the Urison space, or I have some other example from Banach space theory. Uh, the absorption property, as it is stated here, is not good enough. So what does it mean as close as we wish? We actually need so-called metric enriched category. So, uh, well, those of you who are in category theory know very well, perhaps. So the home sets are metric spaces, very likely complete metric spaces, and the composition is uh, typically, you assume, one Lipschitz yeah, on both sides. And uh, now being as close as we wish means that there is one more parameter, positive epsilon, and the composition of this, and the composition of this is epsilon close. And there are examples that you have this property, but you do not have strict version without epsilons. And okay, the, the time is passing, so yeah, the, back, the abstract back and forth argument can be written. Okay, it's not the proof is not written. The, the argument is in the proof, of course. Yeah, the two processes with the absorption property are isomorphic. So please forgive me because I didn't have time and uh, say this is actually not a mathematical conference so I, I'm not giving all the definitions or proofs but what does it mean isomorphic means that uh, in, a sper in a bigger category where the objects are sequences there will be an isomorphism but uh, forget about it we usually not usually always when we look at concrete cases we embed everything into a bigger category and we look at colimits. So you can actually read these two processes with the absorption property have isomorphic colimits. And uh, yeah, okay, so this is what it says. Let me just now I'm changing the topic a little bit because I would finally I would like to say what a generic mathematical object is. Yeah? So <coughs> there could be several definitions. But now once you have these evolution processes, which is nothing but a category with a little bit more structure, perhaps metric enriched, uh, now you can imagine that we are, we are building sequences. Fe sequences are functors from the natural numbers, right? And 
we look at colimits. So formally finite sequences form a tree and infinite sequences are branches through the tree. And uh, such a tree is actually a, a metric space. So we can say that some subset of branches is generic if it is dense and G delta or something like that. But this requires some basic topology. So I don't want this. I, I would like to make a concrete definition which should be understandable to everybody. It doesn't need almost any mathematics, uh, only some basic category theory, very basic one. <coughs> but I should explain Banach Mazur. So uh, it's not because Banach was working here in Krakow, and it's, it really has, uh, I mean, Banach Mazur game really exists in the literature. And this was uh, the original one was played with intervals on the real line was a game invented by Masur, and it is quite well known in, say, descriptive set theory topology. But be, again, because of time, I will not go into details. It's not my invention, yes? Simply the game exists, and I'm defining a more abstract version, and the same name is okay, because if my category K is a partially ordered set yeah, of open intervals, and the, include, the reverse inclusion, then this would be the original one. So after all, it's really more general. So now K, this Gothic K is a category. And there are two players, Eve and Adam, let's say. Yeah? So obviously, Eve should start the game. So she, she, she chooses some object. Um, yeah, if we actually, if we go back to these evolution schemes, the beginning of the game would be slightly different. She would not choose A0, she would just choose some transition from the initial state, but never mind, some small. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Uh, you see, I thought that I should not put the definition of a category anywhere, so K is a category, and this is the class of objects. Yeah, any, any. And, okay, Adam responds with some, say, bigger objects. So imagine that the arrows are some sort of embeddings, yeah, although it could be something completely different. Then, okay, let's not read all the details. This is the result. So I can explain on this diagram. If starts with this, yeah? Of if we have this evolution scheme, then if, if would actually start with some transition. At the beginning of the game is not important anyway. Then uh, Adam responds with this, if responds with this one, and so on. And now we, we cannot say who wins. Yeah? So this is on the next slide. Because now this is a game just for fun, yes? Nobody wins, we just pro they just produce a sequence. So, now I need to know that K is a subcategory of something bigger where, where sequences have colimits. And now, now you have a definition, and this is what I call generic object, yeah? So, this being generic is always with respect to something, to some subcategory. Uh, in set theory, there is a notion of generic filter. Yes? So it has kind of sort of similarities, but it's not the same definition. Um, OK, and uh, one basic remark. Hmm? Oh, I should be finishing very soon. Yeah? So and you see, I have. I was afraid that I do not have enough slides, yes, but I'm more or less in the middle. So I will finish very quickly. A generic object is unique. Yeah. Why? Because if we have two objects for which... Uh, ah, I don't have to say what the strategy is. Yeah. So it's a recipe, yes, how to play. So if you have two generic objects, uh, if... OK, Adam is playing according to the strategy for the first one. If can play according to the strategy for the second one. So they obtain the same. 
Okay. So let me just, uh -huh. yeah, what is missing here? Fraser limits are generic, okay, with respect to finite models. So, okay, let's skip this example. This is something, a class with no amalgamation property and still has a generic object. This I already mentioned, so I can skip. Yeah, here I will probably finish with this example because, uh, okay, the Urison space can be here, but okay, so this will be more or less the last slide plus references in the end. So th this is quite interesting, at least to some people, definitely. So the Urison space uh, is generic, say this thing which you already know because I mentioned it at the beginning. And it's not formal, it's not a phrase limit, yes, but uh, <coughs> actually the proof is pretty easy. You can imagine the uh, strategy, yes. If starts the game, so let's forget about it for a moment. I will explain in a minute. So let's say if, if starts the game and she gives you a finite metric space. And you know that this finite metric space is inside the Urison space, yes? So you find, you record some embedding. But you have to respond with something. If you respond with the same, it's not good, no, not a good strategy. So you extend somehow. Okay, actually the, pic the picture could be relevant here. So if uh, gave you a finite metric space, finitely many points, yeah? Here you have U. I, I, let's say that I'm Adam now, so I'm finding a copy of this. And I'm responding with something bigger. I mean, I add at least one more point here, or maybe three, four points, yeah, and I draw a copy of this here. So I have something bigger. You will see why. If it gives me something bigger, now I have the extension property for the Urison space. So I, I know that I can extend this, yeah? And why am I adding more points? Because in the end, I do not want just an embedding. I want an isometry onto, yeah? So it's enough that I will capture a dense set in the end. This is the strategy. And I will get an isometry. I mean, an, an isometric embedding of the union whose image is dense. And for completions, I have a bijection. Yeah. Uh -huh, I should remember that uh, co-limit of a sequence of complete metric spaces is the completion of the union, not just the union. That's the point. OK, so as to finish, what is this Gurari space? So it's an, simply an analogy. Instead of finite metric spaces, you take finite dimensional Banach spaces. Amalgamation property is quite standard. It's enough to know linear algebra and the definition of the norm. And it's easy. Everything is fine. Uh, what is problematic here is that uh, the, this, the Gurari space. So Gurari was a mathematician from Soviet Union. Maybe from Georgia. I'm not sure. It's hard to find information. He passed away already. It was in 66. Yeah, it is written here. And it took 10 years until people found that it is unique up to a linear isometry. And the problem is that the extension property, okay, so the Urison space has this extension property, finite metric spaces, yes, isometric embedding of a smaller extends to the bigger. This is not true for the Gurari space, unfortunately. I mean, isometric embedding extends to an epsilon isometric embedding. And this was a, a small problem, but caused quite a lot of trouble. I was lucky some few years ago to find a proper framework for it. So the crucial lemma was showing that epsilon isometric can be in some sense corrected to isometries making epsilon error, of course. And now the proper, st okay, so this theorem is true. You play with finite dimensional Banach spaces and the second player has a strategy such that the completion of the union is 
this space here, yeah? no matter of how if place. But uh, it is not trivial. You need to know some, let's say, okay, proper framework for this. And the proper framework for this kind of objects is not only metric and rich category, because you need to look at um, uh, embeddings and compare the distances. But we need something more, because in order to describe this, we also need to go outside of embeddings to a bigger category, epsilon embeddings. It's actually all linear operators, or bounded linear operators. And uh, there is some extra concept, which, is, which I call a norm on a category. So metric enriched non-categories. This is the proper framework. But I would need one more hour to describe details. So let me just uh, give you, so you see I had some more material, but um, references, yeah? So at this point, you may ignore the second one, because this is when, or well maybe, actually, this is about the Banner Mazur game. We characterize when the game, when the second player has the winning strategy. And it turns out that amalgamation property has to be replaced by something weaker. So if you, yeah, if you are interested in more details, then these two papers are about this game, more or less. And this is this general framework, metric and rich categories with norms, after all, which is not in the title. But I'm working on a new version of this. As you see, this is 2012 and still not published. So, okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>